Hey folks, today I was hoping to answer a question that I get all the time. What if I'm at a jam and I have to take a break, but I don't know the song and I haven't prepared anything, I don't really know the melody, I don't really know the chords, what do I do? It's a situation that we've all been in and you definitely get more comfortable with it as you've experienced it more. But hopefully what I show you today will help you structure your ideas and not get lost in the form, specifically when you're taking breaks over vocal tunes that you're coming into blind. Now, if you're super new to bluegrass and you're starting to improvise, this might not be the video for you. I recommend that you check out my bluegrass improv exercises video that should be popping up up there like a little card maybe a lot of information in that video can also be applied to my improvising over fiddle tunes video once again hopefully that's popping up up there somewhere both of those videos should form a really strong basis for what we're talking about today also remember if you want to support this channel you should hit that subscribe button you can also check out my website lessonswithmarcel.com where you can get some merch that's hopefully a little bit newer than this shirt this is the the first lessons with marcel shirt it is the oldest one it's vintage baby anyway let's get on with the video so it's really important that you start memorizing, learning the chord progression to a song the moment someone starts playing it at a jam. The skill of quickly learning chord progressions and having some way to visualize that will help you so much down the road. So let's see if we can quickly and roughly chart out some of the chord changes to standard bluegrass tunes right here, live on the spot. I'm just gonna do one real quick and let's see if you can tell what I'm doing and how I'm thinking in my brain. So a good example would be, uh, how about How Mountain Girls Can Love? Mm, boys, go back home, back to the girls you love. Jeter, I never wrong, how mountain girls can live. Something like that, right? And instead of just writing the C chord once, I've written it down twice. It's because the C chord actually takes up two measures. We can count that if we have our instrument with us. But if I count my strumming, I get one, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Playing a boom chuck, I'm counting every boom and every chuck. Right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And this really helps me know exactly how long every chord lasts in a tune. Now, I've written them in groups of four, as you can see on the page here. And the reason why I've written them in groups of four is that's a really intuitive way to take in a song. It's four different lines. It's four different phrases. So let's try another one real quick. Uh, what about, uh, a long, long time ago when I left my home to roam down in the hills of Tennessee. Was the sweetest little girl never in this world, that little girl of mine in Tennessee. It would look something like that. That's another good example of how this chart would work out. So let's try one more tune. What about, uh, I am a pilgrim and a stranger traveling through this very some land. I've got a home in the end of city and it's not I made by hand. There you go, there's another tune. This is how I'm structuring the tunes in my head. This is what I'm imagining. And this is what I'm gonna use to format my break. So even though we all already uh, probably know these tunes, I'm gonna pick another one that's real simple that you've definitely heard before. And we're gonna use that as the basis for our improvisation. So how about rolling in my sweet baby's arms? Rolling in my sweet baby's arms. Gonna lay around the shack till the mail train comes back. Rolling in my sweet baby's arms. Right, something like that. Um, these are the chords to the tune. You can see this one works out nicely because uh, every chord that we get lasts for two measures. Just a little bit of symmetry to make this process go along a little smoother. Now, I did talk about how you can find this using strums, counting the strums. You can also find this using vocal lines. Right, when I think about rolling in my sweet baby's arms, that's my first line. Rolling in my sweet baby's arms, it's my second line. Lay around the shack till the mail train comes back. Right, rolling in my sweet baby's arms. So a lot of people eh, intuitively in their body, they can see, all right, the first line was all G chord. The second line, rolling in my sweet baby's arms, split between a G chord and a D chord. And you can start charting it out that way. That's a real simple way to get it in your mind too. Get it in your body, make sure that you can feel these things. So for now, like I said, let's stick with rolling in my sweet baby's arms. And that is gonna be the basis for our improvisation that we create. Now, the neat thing is about half of our break is already written. And I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating. You just can't see it yet, but truly half of the break is already decided for us. 
So within these chords that we've now written down, we can whittle things down to what and when we want to improvise. That is to say, if we break this chord change down into distinct phrases, we will have a form for our break. We won't just be randomly noodling over the chords and hopefully we play the right thing over the right thing. So one way to look at it is we want to be improvising when the vocal line is moving and we want to lay out a little bit when the vocal line is not moving. That means that we're mirroring the shape of the vocal even if we're not playing the vocal line. Now this approach normally lends us a form that looks something like this. This doesn't work out perfectly for rolling in my sweet babe's arms. That's one of the reasons I picked the tune, but I'm gonna show you that in a second. So for instance, in the tune we have rolling in my sweet baby's arms, and then these two Gs are kind of empty. Rolling in my sweet babies. Look, these two Ds are kind of empty, right? Here's where it doesn't work out. Uh, lay around the shack till my mail train comes back, right? We actually do get a vocal line over these Cs, but we're still gonna continue with our system. Rolling in my sweet baby's arms, so there we go. So we end up with all of these first two groupings highlighted green. And that's where we see the most movement in the vocal line, right? We've essentially cut our work in half. So the first thing that you might do with this, now that we have this chart, is you might try improvising something that contains movement where we've highlighted green and where we can just strum the chords where no vocal is happening. Remember, since this video is about improvising, I'm not gonna show you the tabs of anything that I play. I'm mostly just playing G major pentatonic with a minor third here or there anyway. But you can watch that video on improv exercises if you want more information about that. I'm just gonna play some stuff though. So here I go, improvising over the green. I'm gonna be strumming where there is no highlight. So I could come up with something like this. Like I said, my note choice is simple, my language is simple. I'm not trying to play hot licks or anything. I'm just trying to honor the space and make sure that I'm playing for the right length of time and then I'm getting to the chord that I need to strum. If there was an answer where you could just immediately play just all the hottest licks, I would give that to you. But this is a process, right? We need to build it up. So that is step one. But we are gonna make things more complicated. So now we can take the break that we just played and in those places with no highlight where we don't have anything, we can start including some really common language, some cliches of the genre, if you will. And this will take us into actual bluegrass break territory. So there's a couple things that we need to add to this to make it feel more like a real break. We definitely need to do something with those strumming portions because that's not very flat picking like of us. We can strum the chord, you know, maybe a couple times, a little times in there, but it shouldn't be a just half strumming. That's not really what we're going for. So one thing that I'm gonna add is a G run right here. Over here, I'm also gonna add a run. The reason why I picked those moments to add the runs is because they're where G chords are. It's basically an easy lick that we can plug in, and these are traditionally, these are places where G runs are added in, so this makes sense. There, there is a traditional component that makes this contextually a smart choice. Right here, I'm just gonna type the word fill. And this is a concept that comes up a lot. A lot of people call these little chord fills when you can add just a little something to when you're strumming a chord. So let me show you these items. I'm assuming you already know the Lester Flat G run, but we're gonna be doing this. Or, depending on what variation you play, if you play it with all downstrokes, whatever, I don't care. That's what we're playing. Now in, the, uh, in these chord fill sections, I'm looking at where we have this D chord here and where we have this C chord here, we're just looking at adding a little bit of language to when we're strumming the chord. A good example would be this for the C chord. I'm sure you've all probably done something like that. I'm basically taking my index finger, I'm leaving it down, and I'm hammering onto the G string second fret and then strumming it again without my middle finger down. Same thing you can do on the D chord here. Um, I'm gonna hold down my D chord like this, so my high E string is actually muted. And on the G string, I'm hammering on from second fret to fourth fret, and then once again, I'm playing the chord without that finger down. So putting this all together, I'm improvising the green portions, and then I've made some notes about what I'm gonna do in those other sections. It might sound something like this. And 
that would be the tune. Now, that might be enough for some people, but it's not enough for me yet. There's one big thing that I've missed here, and there's one thing that will help make this break sort of sing in context. And I bet some of you have already guessed what it is. And it's a kickoff phrase. Before all of this even starts, I need to add a phrase that gets me into my break. You saw this in the beginning of the video, I did one of these. A good example would be this. Or one of these. Or this. All of those happen right before the break starts, and they're a kickoff phrase, kicking things off into my break. Now, there's actually a video that I made about how to kick off any bluegrass song, and I teach all of those kickoffs in there. So if you can't figure them out real quick just from watching me play them now, you can check out that video, and I'll teach you how to play those. Now, that is a full bluegrass break, what we just played. That's a full break, but it can still feel kind of basic. So the last thing that you might do is create some derivative versions of the phrases that we talked about, these cliche phrases. A lot of times, you can make something that does the same thing, but isn't that classic flat run or those little chord embellishments. So talking about these derivative phrases, let's take the Lester flat G run. Um, Tony Rice has a great example of this where he'll play this. Or sometimes with that, that triplet or those 16th notes. That's, that's a great example of a derivative phrase, but I would stretch that definition maybe a little bit further, maybe even too far. <laughs> this phrase, Right, it has a really uh, leading quality. It takes us to that open G string. And there's a bunch of licks that could do that same thing. I'm thinking of like this banjo lick. Right, that does the same thing as a G run. It sets us up in the same way. So looking at this uh, first line, what if uh, instead I did that banjo lick instead of the Lester flat G run, right? I'm gonna play my kickoff phrase too. And that could be the first line. I bet that sounds a lot more uh, unique to you because you're expecting that Lester Flat G run and I didn't play it. Same thing goes for all of these little chord embellishments. Now you could just go find a pentatonic scale for the C chord or the D chord, and I, I, I welcome you to do that. Um, but you're, you're also welcome to just take these little details and see if you can blow them up into bigger ideas. And that quality, that skill, tends to be what makes more talented bluegrass flat pickers. The ability to take a small phrase and be creative with it, right? So for instance, over C, we had this, right? That's an example of how you might take that phrase and blow it up. It's funny, I can't even help myself, right? I just have to. So this, how many different ways can you rearrange the language in that? Right, that kind of thing, right? Turn it into something new, all the same notes, but I'm no longer strumming, it's no longer part of a chord. Now it has its own language too. You're probably not still playing a break that sounds like that, but that is definitely something you can work towards. One way to tell if you're doing a good job of working towards that is if you listen to me play a break like that, I bet you can understand how I'm structuring it now. You can see all of these two measure phrases. Oh, for the first two Gs, Marcel's just playing language. For the next two Gs, Marcel's playing something that's derivative of the Lester Flat G run. For the next two Gs, Marcel's just improvising. For those D chords, Marcel is thinking about the D chord and embellishing the language we talked about in that D chord fill etc, etc. That's what I really want to see. If you can just start understanding it, that's a huge step in the right direction. And then you can take this and you can play with it yourself. Now I'm talking to a wide range of players in this video. That means it's impossible for me to give individualized practice tips. And that's kind of one of the big failings of this kind of YouTube guitar education. But it's not gonna stop me. I'm still gonna do my best. I bet that most of you that try this are gonna struggle to feel the length of the improvised sections, everything that's colored in green in our chart. The old school advice that you likely get is go to jams, play along to the recording, learn a bunch of tunes. I think that all of that advice is great and I encourage you to do those things. But I am gonna add to that one thing and that is that you can practice this with a metronome. And I'm gonna show you a way real quick that you can practice this using your metronome on your phone or whatever. 
So I'm going to take my metronome right here, and it's set at 140. And you might be thinking, 140, that's super fast, Marcel. But I'm feeling this is the quarter note. It still might be a little quick, but, but it's definitely not as quick as you're thinking. So there we go. There's our click, and I'm feeling da 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 one and two and three and four and like that. I know every time that click happens, I'm coming around to another group of four. So I'm going to have to play over two groups of four and then strum over two groups of four. This is forcing me to feel what two measures is. Really have to understand how long two measures is to keep an exercise like this up. And like I said before, the language that I'm playing, I'm not trying to make it amazing. It's not incredible. It's not the most unique thing you've ever heard. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm just saying stuff. All right, folks, if you like taking this lesson from the biggest, baddest Billy Goat in the barnyard, you know there's a couple things you can do. Like, comment, subscribe, you're on YouTube. I know you understand that. Um, you can also check out my website, LessonsWithMarcel.com. There you can get some merch that's a little bit newer than this guy. Like I said, this is a this is a dated boy I'm wearing today. Um, you can check out all the tabs in the tab store, and you can also sign up for Skype lessons. There's a blog. You can check out all those articles. I know you're going to do it if you want to, and thank you so much for that. Uh, I'll see you for another video soon.